different circumstances this time. Thanks to COVID, we have to maintain a bit of physical distance and which is why probably you aren't here. I'm not sure which makes me more nervous, having you people around me or having this camera facing me, but either way, I'm going to give it a go. So this year's sort of options first open up with two lovely Ganeshas here, one by Badri Narayan and the other by P.T. Reddy. P.T. Reddy was an artist from Hyderabad who came to the JJ School of Art to study in the 1930s. And what's very interesting about P.T. Reddy's career is that we always know of the progress of artist group. But we don't know about a group of five artists that came together under the group of the Young Turks at the JJ School of Art. And another interesting sort of aspect of it is how institutions have changed. This was a time in the nine, late 1930s and the early 40s that it was teachers that encouraged these artists to rebel against the system of education and the art practices of that time. This is a much later version of a Ganesh by P.T. Reddy, but his significance is very often not known. We move on to two contemporaries, now the progressive artist group, the Hussein and the Souza. The Hussein has this two figures sort of back to back, almost like an Adnareshwar of the male, the unison of the male and the female. And the Souza is very interesting because you don't see this very often in Souza's, where it's almost like a study for a painting. It could have been either a work that he intended to execute larger on paper and gouache or a canvas because he's kind of indicated the color arrangement that he intends using going forward. Another work by Hussein where again he combines several different forms and combines them into one in a very interesting fashion. There's Gurcharan Singh, uh, a pastor on paper. Gurcharan, as we all know, sort of was from Delhi and had assisted uh, Krishan Khanna in the mural that he did at the ITC. And since then has moved to Bombay and made a career for himself here. We move on to the Almerikar. Almerikar was born in Sholapur and was strongly influenced by folk imagery at that time. And he, like many other Indian artists, like in Badri Naran, adopted this sort of flat, two-dimensional approach to painting, which comes from Indian miniatures, rather than adopting three-dimensional practices that were prevalent and taught at art school. So he formed his very distinctive style and sort of very stylized figures. And here we see what looks like a young bride getting ready for the ceremony. And here we have an early example of a Pirachi Sagra, someone who's sort of better known as a sculptor and someone who introduced sort of wood collages into painting, where he used colour, texture, dimension on a flat surface to sort of form a kind of very distinct practice of his own. Then again we have two more Badri Narayans, and this has sort of intrigued me a lot because the title, which I think says Buddhist priest and wife. Now, having known Badri and having known his sort of involvement with Buddhism and understanding of Buddhism, would have known that a Buddhist priest cannot have a wife. So I find it very fascinating what made him title it so. Because it, it's not a fundamental mistake he'd make unless he wanted to sort of, he was drawing our attention to something else. And then, of course, we have Suleiman here. We have a small work by Anjanila Menon. We have Nikhil Chagandlal. And this is a work that has taken me by surprise. I've known Jonathan Sen's work for several years. But this is a work which is dated 2019, so it's relatively recent. And even though he's not a young artist, a relatively mature artist, I find a huge leap in his work what we see here. This is a painting which truly has surprised me by being Vittal. I mean, we've always known Vittal to be highly talented 
and someone who didn't sort of exploit his abilities to the maximum. But I think there's something very spontaneous because the punch holes in the work suggest that this is probably a cover. It's on card with uh, leather paper, leather textured paper, on which he very spontaneously worked very vigorously on it in oils. And I think he's captured the essence of whatever he wanted to do very effectively in this work. I mean, I would have thought this to be a little earlier than the date, but it says 87, and it does surprise me. Then you have with the horse, a bull by Sunil Das, someone again from Calcutta who was highly talented as a student, <coughs> went to France on a scholarship, and everyone knows a lot about Sunil Das. We move on here to Bedre, which is, I think, a very early academic study, probably at school or just post school, because these are the kind of postures that new models very often exercise for students to work on. But Bedre hasn't just left it as a drawing, he's rendered it and given it a little more sort of energy than what you would normally sort of expect in a student academic drawing of a new. There's a typical Telangana woman by Vaikuntha, executed I think in acrylics on card. Oh, it's on canvas, apologies. And this is a very interesting work, a toy by K.G. Subramanian. And these toys evolved out of... At Shantini Ketan there was this practice of the Kala Mela which came around, which was basically artists producing work for the audience uh, that surrounds them, the, you know, the people that lived in the vicinity around there in Shantini Ketan. And it was usually work that was made very affordable for people, so it could give them a sort of exposure to starting out with art. And this practice, Shanku Chaudhary started in Baroda at the Faculty of Fine Art a little later. And K.G. Subramanian, who was a teacher there also, the teachers also participated with the students. And he said, how do I offer something different which a common person could relate to it? He thought of these kind of indigenous stories. And this is what he used to do and offer them at very nominal values. It's only now that people have sort of even realized the importance of these works because what was looked at as craft or was dismissed as craft definitely went, was art and moved way beyond craft. Yes, he did want to introduce crafts, people in you know, leather, wood, straw, etc. So he was bringing in art, an uh, element of craft but taking it to a sort of much higher level. And then we have Ravi Mandlik, who again needs no introduction, at least to people here in Bombay. Uh, a product of, I think, the Raja School of Art, and even taught them, and then I think taught for a while at the JJ. Tends to work on a, works very effectively on a very large scale. So even though this may be a large painting, he's very comfortable with scale much larger than this. And then we move on to a drawing by Jogen Chaudhary where he uses, so sort of, you know here there's a link between him and the Prakash Karbanta in this exhibition. Two artists who use bold line to depict their subject and the colour sort of tends to go into the background like Prakash just uses one solid subtle colour while Jogen chooses to leave the paper, the white of the paper as his colour and just uses bold white, a black line to demonstrate what he wants to show. Uh, there is Avinash Chandra, who, if I'm not mistaken, I think was born in Simla, and then studied art in Delhi. And very soon, very early in his career, he departed for England. I think he got a scholarship and went there and never came back. Uh, Avinash Chandra's work has been dominated through his career with either the female and nude, or the landscape. So he's done some very interesting drawings in a similar fashion of uh, buildings and landscapes in London or maybe Europe. And he tends to use line in a different manner from Jogain. It's more delicate, uh, sort of a lot more cross-hatching like you'd see in Abadri or in the Shaman Dattare down here, sort of mass and colour. So here Shaman Dattare, a Bengal painter, 
whose depiction where he, his form sort of he does a very sketchy form and then gives it sort of volume with the cross hatching and the little ink that he used. He's used very he's been very frugal in his use of material here. In fact, I think he's just used a simple blue ballpoint pen because he must have started off with black ink and then wanted to bring in a little bit more of color and then he's used just a simple blue ballpoint pen and I think it's a super effective work. I have to admit a very nice work after a long time of an acrylic on paper by Ram Kumar and I think it's executed in 1993 which was a very, very strong phase of Ram Kumar's work because he starts doing these acrylics in, on paper quite aggressively around 79, 80 and then this sort of re-emerged later in his work into the form of acrylics was this looks predominantly ink with a little bit of acrylic in it yeah, there is acrylic in it but I think very restrained, very controlled and I think very successful And this was a bit of a surprise thrown on me today. Uh, someone very generously has offered Concern India a substantially large painting by Lakshman Shreshta. And they were wondering whether to include it in this sale or not. And I felt it should certainly go in here. It could benefit from a little bit of a clean, but it's just coming. And I think it's a very fine example of sort of landscapes of the mind that Lakshman Shrestha has been well known for all his life. You know, having grown up in the hills, you see sort of aspects of <laughs> the sky and the mountains. And I would say thank you to the donor that was so generous about this work. Here we have an artist who's sort of concerned with the environment continues. We see him almost every year at Concern India. And the elephant's trunk almost sort of inviting plants and birds, flora, fauna to sort of, it's kind of an amalgamation, slightly surrealistic, but says a lot to me as a painting. Here we come to the Prakash Karmarkar which again another artist from Bengal when as we were talking about how his use of the bone line so different from maybe someone like a Shana Dattare or a Padrina Rand where they sort of almost scratch the surface or even the Abhinash Chakra that we saw and then you know we have a work from the 80s by Shamshad Shamshad is someone who we don't see too often and he had strong connects with Hyderabad, even though he was born in Bombay and lived in Delhi. I think the years he spent in his childhood in Hyderabad left quite an impact on him. And he had friends, Lakshma Gao, Devra, Dakoji, Surya Prakash and him. I think there's a work by Surya Prakash also that we'll see later. And they formed a group and did several exhibitions jointly and collectively either at Hyderabad and in the early 80s did a whole travelling show all over India which did bring many of them into prominence having just been restricting themselves to Hyderabad till then. And then we have a work here, sorry, by Abu Zavia. Again, similar concerns, the environment, an elephant and a child and the reason why I say the environment is a strong concern because certain liberties he's taken with the ears of the elephant. They no longer remain the conventional shape, but they almost become like leaves. And all this is speaking about what's happening around us today, and I can see the elephant dominating his work being from Kerala. And then we have Ole, who's sort of abstract works, which could be the cosmos, could be sort of a lot of circular geometric forms. Again, someone we see quite regularly at Concern India. Uh, Adi Brekar. Going on here and then... Oh, this is very unusual, the Anwar. Normally one sees Anwar on canvas and this seems to be on paper. Yeah, dry pastel on paper. Anwar was someone who was kind of 
these were the whole group of artists from Bhopal, which emerged courtesy J. Swaminathan and the Bharat Bhavan. Because with that institution coming, he encouraged a lot of local artists to come to practice. He gave them studio facilities there. And Anwar was one such artist that emerged from that. And S.A. Jrasa was a huge fan of the painter. Another old friend, Omi Patel. Uh, when I saw an image of this work, I imagined it to have been much larger. And I think it's beautiful even in its sort of condensed version. Very sort of balanced, very calm, great use of color. And I quite like it. Then of course, Virat Masoji is the very strange story of somebody born in Maharashtra into a, a, into a Christian priest family and studied art and then went to Bengal and settled and studied art further in Shantiri Ketan and painted there. And I think later in his career he himself became a priest as well and came back towards I think Sholapur or Kolapur, one of the two, he settled there and lived his life there. So we have Ram Kumar here, another acrylic on paper. And if I had to be honest, I'd say I prefer the other one. And the Gopatan Ash, again a painter from Bengal, who was a teacher for many years in his life, and suddenly came into prominence with his works that he did of the Bengal famine. And those sort of the critics took notice of him, and suddenly he became very prominent and then became a member of the Calcutta group of artists and continue his career to the end. This is a work I think pretty late from his career of uh, probably rural Bengal landscape, farmers sort of getting their fields ready for the crop and you know the usual activity that would surround it. Nice subtle sensitive work. And then we come to a Badri which probably has links to, as I was referring to, his Buddhist stories and his tales, but it's like almost like paying homage to the sleeping figure. And having known Bad Badri, he sort of created still life in front, which would well have been something that he saw around him at his home. But I think it's a very nice balance between the still life and the figure because the still life almost becomes a painting of its own within that painting. And you've got a young couple, probably he, the man wears a crown coming to make offerings of a bird and a melon to the monk who's sort of reclining in bed. Then we have a work by Murlidharan here, someone who's, uh, who's done a lot of textile designing and then moved to painting a little late in his career. We don't see much of him, but quite different in his approach of machinery, whether it's functional or scrap is hard to tell, but sort of uses machinery as a, almost like a figure, creating a figure with machinery. And again, no one needs introduction to Maya Burma, a large format watercolor, what I like here is the restraint of color. She does tend to sometimes introduce too many colors in a painting. I think this is very effective, restrained, and successful. Shakuntala Kulkarni, we may not know, but she was a very, very well-known printmaker earlier in her career, and then moved to painting, and now sort of does a lot of performance art where she brings in other artists to collaborate with her in her work and doing work very different from what you might see as a painting here. And Surya Prakash was somebody else that I discussed in relation to Shamshad. They were all part of one group and one generation of artists who grew up in Hyderabad in the 50s and 60s. And that, huh, there's like here, here you've got another very interesting example. We were talking of the Kala, the Nandan Mela in uh, Shantini Ketan, which then moved to the, uh, the fine art fair in Baroda. So this is something typically Jogen would have done 
for the fair in Shantani Kedar. Oh, sorry, it was blue. So these are very simple sort of terracotta objects, day-to-day -day objects, which like Subramaniam, he picks up a bit of the local craft and incorporates it in his work. And I think with that, we're done. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Dadiba.